Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Troy Maris. I am pumped, pumped to have you here. In today's video, we're gonna go under the hood of my color grading workflow and how I use it to process C-Log2 footage coming out of my Canon C7. Insider tip though, by design, this workflow can be adapted to fit any camera's log profile. So let's roll the intro. My color grading workflow is an interesting mix of old school fundamentals derived from our predecessors in the film days, re-engineered to better utilize some of the modern tools and features that we get in DaVinci Resolve 18 and beyond. I've refined this process over the last two years or so, learning along the way from a lot of different sources. The primary source that I've gone for my information has been Colin Kelly, so shout out to him. Check out his channel if you really wanna take a deep dive on this subject matter. Before we actually jump into Resolve, there are two guiding principles that I wanted to lay out for us that we should always reference back to before we make any decision within the Resolve color page. We can always reference back to these two guiding principles. And the first one is work macro over micro. We want to make the broadest adjustments possible to our image. A colorist work should be felt and not necessarily seen. And the, the narrower the adjustment that we make, the more opportunity that we have for something to be spotted or to just feel unnatural. So let's work broad over narrow. The second principle I wanted to lay out is to work simple over complex. Whether we're building our node graph or deciding which tool is gonna to be best to use, with all things being equal, let's do ourselves a favor and choose the simpler of the two options. So to recap, let's work macro over micro and simple over complex. Staying true to those guiding principles, my workflow is gonna begin at the broadest level possible. And that's with color management at the project level. Properly managing this technical journey from our camera's log state into more normalized output for our monitor is a critical step of the process. I don't care what industry that you're in, the difference between a professional and an amateur is gonna be in the way that they prepare their work and color grading is no difference. So let's take the extra time at this foundational stage to properly prepare our images for color grading. And the simplest way that I found to do that is through DaVinci's YRGB color management. So let's dive right in. We'll go ahead and get Resolve opened up and prepare our project. We'll start in the project settings under the color management tab. Here's where we're gonna select DaVinci YRGB color managed. This is what's gonna allow Resolve to help us out mathematically with that log to our normalized image transformation. We'll go beneath that and uncheck automatic color management and begin to choose our own custom color processing mode. This opens up a handful of new options for us. So let's go ahead and get this set up properly. Input color space is what Resolve will default to if a piece of footage has no specific color space assigned to it. Rec 709 Gamma 24 is a good default here. Timeline color space will set to DaVinci Wide Gamma Intermediate. This is a very broad and universal color space that's ideal for manipulating our footage on our timelines before it gets compressed down to a monitor-friendly output like Rec. 709 or sRGB. My output color space will be Rec. 709 and I'll map my gamut to my output color space. I'll opt for none on my input DRT as I don't want my footage being remapped or compressed by Resolve until the final output stage which means for output DRT, I'll use DaVinci. The next three boxes will remain checked. My resize transformations happen in log and I'll have my graphic white levels set to 100 nits. And we're all set. Our project settings are dialed in and we can hit save and press on. Even though Resolve's automatic color management is now in effect, our image still looks flat and washed out. It's because it hasn't been transformed into our Rec. 709 output color space just yet. We need to tell Resolve what type of footage we have here on our timeline so Resolve knows how to convert it properly. You can do that in the Media, Edit, or Color page simply by selecting your clips, right click, input color space, and select the appropriate format. We shot this footage on the Canon C70 in Canon Cinema Gamut C-Log2, so we'll choose that option now. And color management is officially in effect. Let's reference back to our guiding principles for the next step. Let's work macro over micro and simple over complex. The broadest thing that we can do for our footage we just did, which is the project level color management. The next broadest thing that we can do is to develop our look at the timeline level. And you guessed it, we're gonna keep that very simple with just a two node setup. The first node is gonna be reserved for our LUT, our lookup table. 
And the second note will be for some light noise reduction if necessary. But there are a couple things I wanted to point out about LUTs before we get started. The first point is to exercise caution when using LUTs because not all LUTs are created equal and they're not all created to do the same thing. Some LUTs are designed for creative looks like we'll use today. Some LUTs are for transformations, converting log footage into say Rec 7 or 9. Some LUTs do both where they have a transformation and a, a look all built into one. So it's important to know what the LUT you're using is looking to accomplish so you can use it properly. An improperly used LUT can have a really detrimental effect on your footage. The LUT that we're gonna be using today, like I said, is gonna be a creative LUT. More specifically, a creative LUT that is designed to work within the DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate color space that we set in our project settings. And again, not all LUTs are, are designed to work within that space. Fortunately, our man Colin Kelly comes through and he has LUTs designed specifically for this type of workflow. The next point that I wanted to make is that there is no shame in using a quality LUT. It doesn't make you any less of a colorist for using it. LUTs are used at the highest level of cinema, so it's all good. Really, a LUT designed for look development like we'll use today really exists in a practice entirely on its own. So let's leverage the abilities of look designers like Colin to help better our grades. So that first note is set aside for our look development LUT, and I'll go ahead and apply the one from Cologne that I wanna use for this project specifically. And we'll move on to the next node. The next node is for light noise reduction. I'll punch in here on the screen so that way you can see the settings that I found to provide the most pleasing results in a wide variety of environments, and you can always tweak as necessary. It's also worth noting that I often disable this node until I'm ready to export, so that way the noise reduction software isn't bogging down my system. All right, let's pause, let's take a step back and, and really begin to reflect on how far we've come. How much closer we are to our end result than we were when we started with our log image. We have a pretty good looking image already. And we've done all of this without touching a color wheel or pulling a mask. And that, that is the importance of our prep work as professionals. And it's through this prep work we can really begin to set ourselves apart from amateurs. Because by the time we get to our clip level adjustments, which is where we're heading next, 90% of our heavy lifting, it's already done. So let's take a look at our clip level adjustments. And just as a reminder, let's work macro over micro and simple over complex. Even on a clip level, these principles still apply. We want to choose the tool that will give us our desired effect in as broad and as simple of a manner as possible. There are a thousand ways to adjust exposure and resolve. In this node, the only tool I'll be touching is my offset wheel in the primaries. It affects the image globally, it's simple to operate and understand, and it's a time-tested method of adjusting exposure. I mentioned that my workflow was built on the foundation of our predecessors in the film days. Well, the color timers of old, the ones that were responsible for most of our favorite films, they would have used a set of tools very similar to those found in the primaries. They're tried and true, and they get my vote. I'll begin to adjust my exposure by eye first, finding what feels right, because that's gonna be the most important thing. Then I'll glance at my waveform to check my work. We don't need to be perfect just yet, we just wanna be better than where we started, always moving in a positive direction. The things I'm looking for here are my skin tones primarily, and then my highlight information. I want to find a good baseline for both of those to live at. And that's all we'll do in this node. Keep it nice and simple. Rather than adding my next node, I'm actually gonna move on to my next clip. We're gonna work on our projects in passes, and there's a couple reasons for that. The first reason is that we wanna avoid lingering on any one clip for too long. It can be really easy to spend 25 minutes fine tuning and adjusting one single clip. That can really just slow you down and make it near impossible to match any of your subsequent clips with any type of efficiency. A second reason for working in passes is that moving through images quickly keeps our eyes from adjusting to any one clip. The longer that we stare at an image, the more our eyes begin to neutralize that image and make it appear correct. And this might lead to some misinformed decisions as a colorist. So to combat this, we'll cycle through and move through our project in passes. With that said, let's move on to our next clip. Again, we'll add our exposure node and we'll make the appropriate adjustments via the offset wheel. We would then go through our entire project this way, adjusting for exposure in that first node before returning to our first clip and starting a new pass. Now that we've finished our initial exposure pass, we're gonna go back to that first clip and add our next node. That node will be labeled balance and it'll be responsible for adjusting where our colors are landing. Working broadly and simply, I'll again reach for my offset wheel in the primaries and adjust the clip as necessary. Practice doing this by eye first to better develop and train that skill. Then look to your vector scope as a reference. There's no correct balance for your image. 
There's only what feels right. So don't get caught in the trap of letting your vector scope make decisions for you. When I grade, I'm often looking to add as much color contrast as possible. And this is where the vector scope can prove very helpful. I'm looking to get my color information to cross at least two different vectors in my scope. Once you find your sweet spot, go ahead and disable this node and turn it back on a couple times to give you a reference as to where you were and where you are now, making sure that you have made an overall net positive on your image. Go through each clip making this correction to complete this balance pass. This next pass will be all about adjusting contrast as well as the ratio between our shadows and our highlights. Note that this is the first time we're making an adjustment to our clip that doesn't affect the image as a whole, and we're at the end of our workflow. In this new node, assess your image and decide if the contrast is where it needs to be. In a perfect world, our look development LUT on our timeline is already providing the appropriate level of contrast, so you may not need to do anything to this node, and that's okay. Finish out the pass, and we'll move on to the next one. This last pass will be reserved for the few small adjustments that may be left. The most common things I'm using this final pass for would be my hue versus sat curves. If a particular color is coming in too strong or too distracting, or maybe a radial mask to create a minor vignette to help reshape the light and draw my viewer's eye where I want it to go. <sighs> All right, that should do it for your grade. At this point, I would go back to that first clip, enter full screen mode, and play down the whole project from start to finish. Keep a piece of paper and a pencil with you, jot down any notes that you might have as you see these images playing together in real time, then go back and make any adjustments or tweaks as necessary. The key takeaways from today. Take your time building your foundation and doing your prep work. Choose to work broad over narrow and opt for simplicity over complexity every time. The biggest mistakes I see in poor quality color grades come from incorrectly used LUTs or poorly executed source footage, believe it or not. Now the footage that we saw today came from my Canon C70 in C-Log2. For the sake of time, we're gonna move this conversation over into the next video where I talk about why I chose the Canon C70 to capture all of my source footage for my personal projects. But before we go, let's go down below, hit like, hit subscribe, do all the YouTube things, and I'll see you in the next video.